Hi everyone, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Mimple University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Scarface 1920, game designed by Tony Serra de Sanferm and Daniel Simon, and published by Red Zen Games. In this video, we're going to cover the rules for the two to four multiplayer game, and we have a separate video to explain the solo rules in detail. But you'll need to understand these multiplayer rules first. With that said, let's get to the game. 1920s Chicago and Prohibition is in force. Now it's a turf war as black market gangs fill the gap in the market, muscling in on the neighborhoods, running guns and liquor, plus a few legitimate businesses on the side, all in the aim of earning the most cash. But watch out for your enemies as they try to muscle in on your turf, taking your hard earned markets and contraband and keep an eye on the authorities. You may need to slip them a bribe from time to time, but keep on their good side and it could help you in the long run. I won't step you through the game's setup, but I'll show you the components and a few of the key rules. Each player will choose one of the gangs and take all of its matching components. Your player board primarily represents the strength of your boss and your gang, and there's a number of upgrades that will occur on this board. To the side, you'll have a number of control markers, trucks and cars, which you'll be placing and moving on the map. Your thug board contains 12 thug pieces in three separate spaces. Through the game, you'll often have to place thugs on the board or onto actions. And when doing these, they must come from your headquarters. Anything to the left of your headquarters needs to be recruited before it can be used. You'll find the 10 gang member cards which match your gang. The four showing the hat icon you'll set to the side for now. These are advanced cards that you'll have to upgrade to. Shuffle your remaining six cards and draw a starting hand of three. You'll have three random jobs cards and these do not count towards your hand limit. Players will begin with two basic dealers, an alcohol supplier and a gun supplier and starts the game with two guns, two alcohol, or one of each. Whatever you choose, one is stored on each of your dealers. And dealers can store goods even if they don't supply that type. Each player begins with $10, and money is stored behind the screens, so no one else knows exactly how much you have. The main board is primarily composed of the map of Chicago. The map is broken into seven districts, and each district will have one or more neighbourhood tiles on it, with how many depending on your player count. Each neighbourhood randomly starts with one of the game's three legitimate business tokens. There will be three grey police cars on the board, and in reverse turn order players will choose a starting district among the four containing no police. Players will place a control marker on the neighbourhood, and either a truck or a car in the district. Shuffled and placed at the bottom of the board are the jobs and dealers, the one to three star associates with four face up, and the four and five star associates with two face up. In the top right of the board is the raids deck and the crime track, with each player starting at one crime. Players will move up and down this track as they take actions, possibly triggering and suffering worse effects from raids. At the very bottom of the track is a figure representing Elliot Ness, a federal agent from the Prohibition era. Ness always represents the true bottom of this track, and if Ness's figure ever moves up into a space containing a player's marker, the player's marker moves one space ahead. Players may never take an action which reduces their crime to or below Ness's level. In the top centre of the board is a timing track and four newspapers which time the length of the game. Finally, there are three photographs around the outside of the board. The authorities, the underworld, and the prison, which are all places for players' thugs to go. So, with that background, let's learn how to play. Scarface 1920 is played in turns, going clockwise around the table. There are two types of turns. If you begin your turn with any cards in hand or in your deck, then you must take an action turn in which you'll use one or more cards from your hand to take various actions, discard any cards you play, and then draw back up to your hand limit if you can. 
If you can't, you simply draw until your deck is empty. If you have no cards in your hand or deck, then you must instead take a reorganisation turn. A major opportunity to earn money from your businesses, as well as for selling contraband, recall thugs who were sent on actions, and replenish your deck and hand. You'll then advance the time tracker. When the time tracker reaches the extra extra phase, this triggers a raid, a general reset, and a new newspaper article to be flipped face up, adding a new rule for the next phase of play. The time tracker then goes back to its starting position. The game ends immediately when the final news card is drawn and prohibition is over. Players get one last chance to earn some endgame money, and then the player with the most money wins. An action turn is resolved in four steps. First lay out your plan, then carry out actions, then draw new cards, then move to the next player. To lay out your plan, lay any number of cards from your hand face up into your play area in any order. You must lay at least one unless you start the turn with no cards in hand. The first two cards you play are free, but any additional card beyond that causes you to gain one crime. Next is carry out actions. You may have several actions you can take and you can do them in any sequence. There are three types of actions. Skills, which are printed in text on the cards in your plan. Jobs, which come from the jobs cards that you've collected. And orders, which are the 15 basic actions printed here. On your turn, you may complete one single order, any number of the skills on your cards, and any number of jobs. All orders require a combination of influence or muscle, and these can be found in the top left corners of the cards in your plan. This plan, for example, has two muscle and zero influence. All of these influence orders are out of reach. But one of these muscle actions could be done. If you've planned with your boss card, its muscle and influence is based on the current row of your boss figure on your player board. And this will increase as you upgrade your gang through the game. You can only do a single order per turn, but the strength of that order will often be higher based on the muscle and influence in your plan. Many of the orders also require you to place a thug from your headquarters. And on your player aid, these are broken into three groups. Underworld Orders, Authorities Orders, and Other Orders. To take an Underworld Order, place a thug in the Underworld and then gain one crime for each thug you have there. These thugs are tough to get back. When there's a raid, they'll all be moved to prison, and from prison you'll have to bust them out to get them back. But the actions you can do in the Underworld are strong. For an Authorities Order, place a thug in the Authorities with no extra penalty. You'll get them back on each of your reorganization turns. And some of the other orders use thugs in different ways again. Now we'll take you through all of the different orders, and fair warning, we're not going to explain them in the sequence shown on your player aid. First, we'll take you through some of the more engine building actions which will build up the strength of your gang. First is Recruit, which lets you gain more thugs. This is an underworld order requiring influence. For each influence, move one thug from your safe houses to your headquarters, ready to use, or one thug from your slums to your safe houses. The second order is to hire a new associate for your deck. This is an underworld order requiring influence. There will be six associates available, four in the one to three star deck, and two in the four or five star deck. Choose one associate whose number of stars is equal or lower to the amount of influence in your plan, and then take it from the display. Slide any cards in that section to the right to fill the empty space, and then reveal the top card. By default, your new card goes into your discard pile, but you can add it straight to your hand by paying alcohol. One alcohol for a one, two, or three star card, or two for a four or five star card. You may only hire one associate per order and any excess influence is lost. Any time you hire an associate, either through this order or any other effect, you immediately gain the family ring from the board or from whichever player currently has it. 
Anytime you start your turn with the family ring, gain money equal to one fewer than the number of players. Finally, note that every associate you gain is going to be worth $2 for each star on its card at the end of the game. The third order is to gain a job. This is an underworld order requiring influence. Draw jobs cards equal to the influence in your plan. Look at them, choose one to keep face down, and return the others to the bottom of the deck. As an action on your turn, you can play a jobs card by flipping it face up and resolving its effect as long as you meet its criteria. You may do this any number of times on your turn. There are three types of requirements. A have requirement is a condition that you need to meet at that time. Here, for example, having one thug in the authorities. A spend requirement is something you have to give up. Here, for example, one gun. And plan requirements need a certain combination of things face up in your plan this turn. Here, for example, a one or two star associate and three muscle. You then have two different types of job cards based on their effects. An instant effect is resolved as soon as you play the card face up, and a permanent effect becomes an ongoing passive ability for your gang. Jobs can be very powerful if used at the right time and used effectively, so take a good look at the three jobs you get at the start of the game and work out how you can best use them to your advantage. The fourth order is to add business markers, and this is an authorities order requiring influence. For each influence, add one of the three basic legitimate business markers onto a neighbourhood that you currently control. Nightclubs do not count towards this action, these are special businesses. There can be a maximum of three businesses per neighbourhood and multiple copies of the same business. You can add businesses to multiple neighbourhoods on the same turn, if you control all of those neighbourhoods. If the supply has run out of a certain type of business, no more may be added. There's no basic difference among the business types. Each will give you $3 in each of your reorganisation turns and at the end of the game. However, if you have certain types of cards, they may combo with a specific type of business better than the others. The fifth order is to upgrade your gang. This is an other order, and it doesn't require you to spend a thug, but it will cost you some money. Choose one of your six rows to upgrade. Pay the money cost in its leftmost open box and have the necessary muscle or influence in your plan. Take the next upgrade cube in the direction of the arrows from your boss figure. Gain the amount of crime showing in the box you're about to upgrade, and then cover the box. Now move your boss figure along the track, gaining any upgrade which is shown in the box covered, and this may also increase your boss card's influence and muscle. The boss upgrade side of the board will give you access to your hat cards, that is the right hand man cards that you set aside at the start of the game. When you unlock one, choose one of the four cards to gain, adding it to your discard pile or to your hand if you pay two alcohol. If you really commit to these upgrades, there's $105 in bonus money to gain as well. On the right hand side, you can increase your hand size. Getting more lawyers, recruiters, or dealers supply will level up some other actions, which we'll speak about later. The bottom two will give you an immediate placement on the map. If you upgrade nightclubs, flip over any one neighbourhood you control from its day side to its more profitable night side. Return any markers to the neighbourhood and add a nightclub. Nightclubs don't count to a neighbourhood's three business limit, but now that it's on the board, it otherwise behaves like any other business. If you get a vehicle upgrade, then take any one of your remaining trucks or cars and add it to a district containing at least one of your coloured pieces. If the district you choose has any police cars in it, then you must pay the police a bribe of $2 per police car, otherwise you can't choose that district. The placement of vehicles is a good segue into our next group of orders, which relate to how you spread your influence on the map. The sixth order is to send your thugs from your headquarters to the districts. This is an other order, and it requires you to have one muscle in your plan per thug you send. 
thug placement rules are the same as vehicle placement. Each must go to a district already containing at least one of your pieces. And if there are police cars in the district, you must pay a bribe of $2 per thug per police car. The seventh order is to move your thugs and vehicles, and this is an other order requiring muscle. Each muscle lets you make one movement, and a single piece may not move more than once per order. When a thug moves, it moves on foot to an adjacent district. When a vehicle moves, one movement may move it anywhere on the map. The exception to this is that thugs may move greater distances like a vehicle if those thugs move with a vehicle. This still costs one muscle per piece, but it allows the thugs adjacent movement rule to be ignored. So for example, these two thugs and this car could move all the way over here for a total of three muscle. Once again, if you move into a district with a police car, then you must pay a bribe equal to $2 per piece per police car. This brings us to the eighth order, which is to seize one neighborhood. And this is how you get your control markers onto the map. Each neighborhood has a natural defense. And if there are any police cars in the district, the defense is increased by one per car. You break down the defenses of that neighborhood by your thugs and cars being in the district. Trucks have no effect. Any difference must be made up from muscle in your plan. So in this case, the neighborhood has a defense of five, three of which is broken down by the player. Therefore, if the player has at least two muscle in their plan, they may seize this neighborhood and place a control marker upon it. This order can also be used to seize a neighborhood from another player. The current owner's thugs and cars contribute to the neighborhood's defense, as does the control marker, which contributes to defense. Here, the neighborhood's defense is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, while the blue player breaks down four of that defense. Therefore, blue needs four planned muscle to seize the neighborhood. The new owner retains any businesses or contraband which was in that neighborhood, even a nightclub. And this can include a nightclub, even if the player hasn't upgraded their nightclub staff. Controlling neighborhoods is critical because it's selling guns and liquor into the neighborhood you control that's going to earn you the lion's share of your money. Next, we're gonna look at your black market activities, specifically the orders which help you to gain and sell your guns and alcohol. To start the game, each player has two dealers, one gun supplier and one alcohol supplier. The ninth order is to get one dealer. This is an underworld order and requires influence. Draw one dealer card for each influence in your plan. Look through them and choose one to keep, returning the others to the bottom of the deck. Now you have a choice. You can either use this dealer to create a new deal, and if you do this, place the card next to your existing deals, like so. Your other option is to expand an existing deal. Slot the card underneath one of your existing deal stacks so that you can only see the bottom line. There's no limit to the number of different deals you can have, and there's no limit to how large an expanded deal may be. Your tenth order is to get a supply of guns or alcohol from a deal, and this is an other order requiring some combination of muscle and influence. Choose a deal that has fewer thugs on it than its thug limit. Place a thug onto that deal. In your plan, you must have at least as much muscle and influence as the total cost of that deal. So here it would be three muscle or two muscle and an influence. Gain guns or alcohol equal to the total supply amount for that deal. And if your gang has upgraded its dealer's supply, then gain one or two extra resources of any type for each dealer in the deal. Store the resources you've just gained. Each deal can hold a maximum number of resources as shown in the storage icon in its top right corner. And all the rest are stored in neighborhoods you control. This icon on a neighborhood shows that it has an unlimited storage capacity. You can always spend any of these resources from your deals or neighborhoods you've controlled. 
But be warned, goods stored in one neighbourhood can't be sold to a different neighbourhood. You're not allowed to rearrange goods between different storage locations unless you get a specific effect allowing you to do so. And if someone seizes one of your neighbourhoods, that player now controls any goods that were there. The eleventh order is to sell goods into your neighbourhoods. This is an underworld order which requires influence. For each influence in your plan, choose one different neighbourhood that you control and then make a sale into that neighbourhood. Sell the resources showing at the bottom of the tile either from that neighbourhood or as stored on your deals. Then gain the money printed on the tile. For each of your trucks that you have in the neighbourhood's district, you get a one resource discount on the cost of the sale, down to a minimum of zero. So here, the player could spend two alcohol and a gun, with a two discount for these trucks, earning a sale price of 32. For each police car in the district where the sale took place, pay a bribe of $2. Importantly, this order is not the only way to trigger sales in your neighbourhoods. On each of your reorganisation turns, you will get to sell into each one of your neighbourhoods if you can, and so always make sure you're timing your actions to make the most of these free sales. The twelfth order is another way of selling, and this is to sell to the authorities. This is an authorities order requiring influence. For each influence, sell one of your stored resources for a fixed price of $6. This is a relatively similar price to what you'll get on most of the open markets. But it's a slower way of selling because you require one influence for each resource sold instead of one for an entire sale in a neighbourhood. There are three more orders to explain and these are all authorities orders requiring influence. You could reduce crime, going down on the crime track one step per influence. You could break your thugs out of prison. As long as you have at least two influence in your plan, take all of your thugs from prison and return them to your headquarters ready for use. Finally, you could get the authorities to fight your turf war for you. For every five influence in your plan, remove one player's control marker from any neighbourhood on the board, leaving it neutral until someone else seizes it. During the carry out action step, you may resolve skills from the cards that you've played in your plan. Skills with no icons showing may always be resolved. Skills like this are called matching skills and they show one or more of the six card icons at the start of the skill. A matching skill can't be resolved unless you have at least one of that icon in your plan, so right now this would not be valid. But if these bodyguards were played instead, then this skill could be resolved. Your boss has special skills shown at the bottom of your player board, and when you play the boss, you may resolve three of these four skills, including the same skill multiple times. Unlike most of your other starting components, these are quite asymmetrical between the four gangs. I won't go through every skill, but I'll show you some key ones which introduce rules we're yet to see. The starter decks contain bodyguards cards, which let the players influence the movement of police around the board. Each lets you move a police car from a district where you control a neighbourhood for free, or from any other district for a gun or alcohol. Police cars, like the player vehicles, can move anywhere on the board in one step. The starter decks also contain lieutenants who allow you to retrieve thugs from districts or deals back to your headquarters. Many cards give you various ways of gaining money based on what's on the board, either from the supply or stealing from another player. Some will combo with types of businesses or with other locations such as the underworld or authorities. Some give you ways of gaining thugs from your safe house or slums instead of your headquarters. Cards may allow you to hit or kill rival thugs. A thug who's hit returns to the owner's safe houses, and a thug who's killed returns to the slums. Some cards also give you ways of scoring extra money at the end of the game. If when you begin your turn you have no cards in either your hand or deck, then you must take a reorganisation turn and follow these steps. Firstly, if possible, you may make a sale into each district you control. 
This works the same way as the selling order, including discounts for trucks and bribes to police. Then gain $3 for each legitimate business on a neighbourhood you control. Next, recover all of your thugs from the authorities, your deals, and if applicable, your jobs, returning them to your headquarters. Check your number of lawyers and retrieve that many of your thugs from the prison. Check your gang's number of recruiters and do that many thug recruitment steps. Reshuffle your discard pile to form your deck and draw up to your hand limit. Advance the timing marker, and if it hasn't reached the extra extra box, play passes to the next player. If the marker does reach this box, then you'll resolve the extra extra phase. And the first step of this is to resolve a raid. A raid will also occur immediately if a player's crime marker reaches step 11 on the crime track. In this case, you'll complete the action which triggered the raid, then resolve the raid, and then return to whatever step of the player's turn it was. The first step of any raid is to clear all thugs out of the underworld and put them in prison. Then draw a raid card and resolve it top to bottom. The raid effect is common and impacts all players equally, or impacts one of the game's global conditions. Next are the coloured effects, and each player will have to resolve one of these effects based on the colour of their position on the crime track. If you can't suffer the entire penalty, then suffer as much as you can. Then all players move down the crime track according to this step at the bottom, and more often than not, this is equal to the player's lawyer value. This is the end of the raid, so if it was triggered off the track, you'll move back to wherever you left off. If it was an extra extra raid, then continue with these steps. First move Elliot Ness one step up the track, then discard the rightmost associate cards to the bottoms of their decks and refresh. Reveal the next news card from the news deck. This will give you a new special rule which will be in effect while this card is on top. Then reset the timing marker to its correct starting position. At the end of the third extra extra phase, prohibition is lifted and the game ends immediately. Players should take note of how much money they've gathered behind their screens. All players run all legitimate businesses they control one more time, again gaining $3 per business. But leftover resources in controlled neighbourhoods are not worth anything. Prohibition's over, so there's no more black market, and you need to watch the end of the game carefully to make sure you're not left with a huge amount of worthless merchandise. Count up all the stars on associate cards you've hired and gain $2 per star. And if you meet any other end game conditions on cards you've gained, receive that now. The player with the most total money wins. If tied, whoever had the most money behind their screen before final scoring breaks the tie, and if still tied, victory is shared. And that's how to play Scarface 1920. We hope you enjoyed this video, and do check out our solo rules video if you'd like. We have a link to that in the description below. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us, you can also hit the meeple in the corner to do that, and hit the bell icon so you'll know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. Comments, suggestions and feedback are all welcome in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, see you next time.